All right. All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, today is August 8th, 2019, and this is the Hyperledger Technical Steering Committee call. Everybody is welcome from the community to participate on this call, so long as you abide by the antitrust policy and our community code of conduct, which says a variety of things, including please be respectful of everybody's contributions, regardless of what they look like. Uh, and since this is a phone call, regardless of what you think that they might look like. Okay, first off, announcements. It is coming up on election season for this steering committee. Uh, nom <clears throat> we'll enter a nomination phase uh, next week. Uh, we had publicized this process a little bit more in advance in the past. Uh, we had some things like the, the member summit going on last week that threw a wrench in that. But we're gonna try to do our best to make sure that this is well advertised. One of the issues that we noticed last year was that the people who nominated themselves or who were nominated didn't necessarily represent the full breadth of our community. And so what I'd like to ask everybody who's participating on this call to do is to think about whose opinion they respect in the community, who's been a strong contributor here, and maybe reach out to that individual and uh, ask them to nominate or perhaps nominate that individual. And maybe in that way, we'll get a more uh, representative and, and diverse set of, of nominees to uh, review for this upcoming election. One other thing to point out is that we can get the eligible participants from uh, code contributions pretty directly. The working groups, though, are less automated. So if you are a working group chair or you know a working group chair, that person should have received a note from, uh, I think, Dave within the last several hours. That's and, correct. And that is requesting that you provide a list of the contributors to your working group uh, to Dave. That should be people who have contributed from, um, I guess, September of 2018 up till uh, this point. The lists are supposed to go to Rye, uh, Dan. Sure, sure. Note came from Dave, but send your response to Rye. That's um, great. I'm concerned that I might not get enough email, so I've asked everything to uh, run through my address anyway. That's great. Uh, let's see here. So, and then Rye, will you be uh, hitting that full list of people so that they know that whether or not their name is on there? Uh, the full list of the working group submitted people? It, when you have the entire list from the the contributors mined out of the Git logs and the working group people, everybody will receive a invitation to the nomination process. Is that how that will work? Good question. I see. Uh, how did we do it last year? And uh, I see Tracy is saying, yeah. Yeah, I can help with that. So um, last year we created the list um, of people who contributed via code contributions, got the list of people who contributed via the working group chairs, uh, posted that list on the TSC mailing list for um, a time period so that people who may have contributed but somehow didn't show up on the list could um, let, let us know that they contributed. Uh, once the contribution list was created and the, the timeline passed, uh, an email was sent out to those people um, who were eligible, uh, basically made a contribution in the past year, uh, letting them know that they should, if they want to, send their um, Nomination to Todd, uh, last year it was Todd, so I'm assuming this, this year it'll probably be you, Rai, or Dave, or somebody else. Um, and then uh, Todd compiled those uh, people, created the, the poll through whatever that polling tool was that we used, uh, and sent out the, the poll to the people who were on the contributors list. Um, and then I think, you know, what was it, a week or something that people had to fill out who they wanted to have in the TSC. Uh, after that, the 11 TSC 
people uh, had like a week or something to nominate themselves for TSC chair. Uh, and then the TSC uh, voted on the new TSC chair. Okay, thanks for the. Again, <clears throat> this this Chris. So, um, I'd like to raise a, a point, and I think Brian is on, um, and Salona. You know, we we started Hyperledger with eleven premier members, and you know, we sort of crafted the TSC around an initial. You know, each each premier member got to name a, a temporary TSC person until the first election, um, six months later. Uh, the board is now at 21, and yet we haven't grown the TSC, and we now have more projects than we have TSC members, and we also have a number of working groups and so forth where people are, you know, contributing meaningfully and so forth. I'm just curious to see what other people think about the prospect of potentially expanding the TSC membership so that we can get broader representation of uh, a lot of the projects that are probably underrepresented and just get be interested to get people's thoughts on that. I would be interested in that. I think um, expanding the diversity would be great. I think being able to have a more diverse representation is a good thing. Um, we want to be careful that we don't um, get to be too big to where no one feels like they have a specific responsibility. But yeah. I think we could grow some before that would happen. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really with you. I mean, I'm not suggesting that we make it unlimited, but um, I think we have we may have an opportunity here to actually modify what's going on, and I'd just like to have people think about that. It doesn't have to happen before you know we have our election. So, Chris, uh, what was the number you suggest? Well, I don't know. I mean, like I said, the board is up to 21 now. Uh, we have, uh, I think, 13 projects or tw tw certainly 12. Um, I'm starting to lose count. Um, and, uh, uh, and I think we all know that there's a couple more that may be proposed soon. And, um, yeah, uh, 13 is not a lucky number. Yeah, well, so maybe... Well, you know, 15 know. or 17 would be reasonable, eight, too. Yeah, 17 maybe to keep so. it odd. Yeah, maybe 18. Well, yeah. if I could interject, this is one of the smallest uh, TSCs I worked with. So, yes, I support that. And uh, one thing that we did on other TSCs was kind of a rolling quorum, where if you don't show up for so many, uh, so many meetings, then your vote is lost for quorum. Uh, so that people who don't show up uh, don't uh, clog the voting process. And that's one thing to keep in mind is as we expand, more people would need to be here to meet quorum anyway. Um, and I was just going to add to that, Chris. I think, you know, that the, the diversity of projects is requiring a diversity of talents. And as the projects are coming in and the proposals come in, um, having a diverse TSC where we've got experts on a lot of different areas would be really helpful as well. So, uh, I fully agree. If I can uh, throw in another thing. So, um, uh, one of the suggestions that has come up uh, to me, at least in terms of looking at increasing diversity, was to do something that I believe the Cloud Native Compute Foundation does, which is that. Uh, the um, what they call their technical oversight committee rather than technical steering committee um, uh, can appoint, I forget if it's them or if it's the governing board, but either one of them um, uh, appoints additional uh, at-large seats to the, the TSC, to the TOC in their case. Um, and those are um, not voted upon by the general population, but, a, but assigned. So imagine, for example, the 11 new TSC members, you know, just after they've been elected, then has the opportunity as their first decision to go, well, who are, say, five more people, or six to keep it odd if we want, um, six more people in our community who we feel, um, you know, not enough people know about, but, but really we'd love to also reach out to. And that can be to increase diversity in a number of different ways of projects, of gender, of, of, of other things, or simply under, underheard voices, right? Um, uh, that, that, that helps it be, you know, um, avoid being, hey, elect 21 new people, most of whom you don't know. 
Yeah, no, I, I, Brian, I think that was baked into the TOB charter initially that they were going to have six, I think, and then they could pick one additional or something along those lines. That's not a bad idea. Yeah. So here's what I would like to do then, um, especially since this wasn't on the agenda for people to, to think about prior to today. Let's let's continue that discussion on the mail list, and I'd recommend that that's maybe one of the first actions that the new TSC uh, takes a look at. It's it's a little bit awkward to change elections right before they happen, and uh, we're yeah, already I'm not suggesting we do it before. It, it, it will okay. also require a charter amendment, which would need to be approved by a supermajority of the full governing board. So that'll take just a bit of time on its own. Okay, so maybe it's the board that has to make that decision. Yeah, but I'm sure if the TSC came in and said, what do you think about this? Um, right. Then it was well argued. I would be surprised if there'd be much pushback. Okay. Would it be inappropriate to say that, the, you know, this is the first order of business and perhaps the, the plan is that this TSC, that the, after this election, the TSC is constituted lasts for like three months until there's a new round of elections to expand? Not that the people who run would have to rerun, but that the, the stated goal is that should the governing board approve, we expand the TSC and we run another round of elections in December or something of that nature. There's yeah. a few hypotheticals bound into that. Um, so I think it's best, let's just keep the election as it's written as we're heading into the, you know, we only have a couple weeks before that. And then let's let the, the new TSC uh, tackle that problem. I'm sure they can come up with rules like like what Rai just suggested that within some reasonable period of time they they elect the additional participants. Okay, so the main message though for today is because we've got less runway in front of us than we've had in previous elections, uh, please do reach out to those leaders that you respect in the community and encourage them to nominate themselves into this steering committee. All right. Um, project life cycle task force. Uh, so we, we were able to not, um, we were able to, to resolve two of the resolutions last time. And I think we've got, uh, Arno was just saying a few more uh, lined up, ready to go. When I checked in on these earlier this week, I didn't see any additional discussion. So I'm hoping we might be able to knock through uh, several of them here. Yeah, so the agenda is a bit optimistic in saying vote on remaining resolutions. I don't think we can do that for all of them, but I think we can have like consider, I put three of them that I think are probably low hanging fruits. Um, <clears throat> so we can start and take them one by one. The first so, one is issue do, one. Sorry. Hang on, Arna, Arna, do we have the link to that offhand? Oh, wait, where did that go? It's in the agenda. As, as I say, I'm looking at the agenda. I want to wonder if I just need to refresh. Um, sorry. Is this the page that I'm displaying right now? I'm looking at the 2019 yes. 808 TSC agenda and yeah, the Project Lifecycle Task Force should be a link to the page. Okay, there. got right. it. That's what I'm looking for. Thank so you. If you look at the top, scroll I back up, please. Yes. Yeah. This. Okay, so I, you know, so there's a, we have two resolved issues we discussed last week, four and five. So now we'd like to tackle one, seven, and eight. Okay. So the first one, let's start with issue one. There are two related proposed resolutions. Uh, <clears throat> essentially, it's, it's similar. The first one is, you know, it's to try to deal with the situation where you have basically a defunct or ghost project, right? And so it defines that after six months, you know, with that activity, uh, the TSC basically would take the decision to move the project to deprecated status, which is the status we have in a project life cycle. And after six more months, if nothing happened, then it does move to end of life, which is also a status we have. So this kind of defines the transitions with periods of six months. It also defines 
at least partially what constitutes activity, right? So at the end there, it says software releases, quarterly TSC report, as well as significant code enhancements will be considered as signs of activities. So there is one caveat in this, which is when we define deprecated, um, basically the idea was actually something a bit more, you know, uh, voluntary, if you will. So the idea was, well, there's a project that says, okay, we are done. Now we're going to deprecate this project. We still commit to maintain it for six months. In this case, well, we can't have that commitment fulfilled because we are in this situation where people have basically abandoned the project and we're just saying, okay, we need to, we need to put this guy to rest. But I think it's a minor glitch and I don't think it's a big deal. We can just ignore that for now. If we really wanted, we could go and alter the definition of deprecated, but I honestly don't think that's really a major issue. And, and the other one, which I don't think is gonna be controversial, is basically the same, but it's at the request of the project maintainers themselves. Okay, it's, they are, it's the project maintainers who come and say, hey, TSC, we, we want to move to deprecated because we're not planning to keep on working on this. All right, well, I think that's all very clear. Does anybody need any clarifying uh, questions? Um, yeah. Yeah. So we're, we're voting on resolution 1-1 one, one as opposed to resolution 1-2 for it. We'll be voting on both of those resolutions. So um, I guess I should have looked at this more closely before. We actually have an archive. We have the Hyperledger Archives organization for archive projects for you know whatever reason we're creating yet a new status here end of life um and yet we already had a, a no no we're not creating it chris it exists in the life cycle we well, haven't yeah. used it yet but it's defined okay so the hyperledger archives uh i i created that a long time ago back at the beginning of time I created that as a parking lot for pre-squash uh, projects. So like the fabric, the original open, uh, open chain uh, repos are in there and all of that. And then as uh, projects like Aroha, for instance, have said, we're done developing this, uh, I have moved those projects into the Hyperledger archives on GitHub. So that was a creation of mine to, uh, not lose history and yet not clog our GitHub org with stuff. So don't read too much into the fact that it exists and that it's a tool that we can use. So, but I don't think the two are necessarily in conflict. I mean, um, there is no status in the project of life. There is no archive status, but nothing prevents us from saying, hey, when project reaches end of life, we will archive it, okay. you know? Right. So, and... There has, GitHub has introduced a status since the beginning of Hyperledger, which is to archive a project. So that's a new status where I can click a button on a project and say it's archived and you no longer get pull requests, you no longer get any of that. So there are additional uh, states in the state transition diagram there. Oh, okay. okay, that's good. So yeah, but I mean, okay, fair enough. Well, we could we could then have another resolution about renaming end of life to archive. I mean, I don't care. Mechanically, it's yeah, the yeah. same thing. Yeah. Hi, it's Bobby. How are you? Um, on the um, homepage for the life cycle project, I put a grid on there that if um, Rai, if you could scroll back up to that first page, it shows the project life cycle and all where the issues fall in the life cycle. And then I've noted the ones that we've resolved. So just scroll down a little bit more. So if you'll see, I put across the top the project life cycle stages and yeah. then where the issues fall and whether they're resolved or not. Just hoping to organize this a little bit more. Thank you. Okay, so I think with the, the clarification that, that EOL is not a new um, 
state that that's in the existing life cycle document. Um, is there anything else that needs clarification before we move into a vote for uh, these two resolutions? So Mick, you said one one, did you have a problem with one two? These aren't Sorry, alternate no. resolutions. That I was no, I was just trying to figure out if we if it was an either or or if it was, uh, okay. or if it was about no. I it, we had this discussion earlier. My concern with one two uh, when when I think we had one two as the only one or some variant of it was uh, what if the maintainers are gone? Who does the proposal? So yeah. so if this is a both, I am very happy with it. I just wanted to make sure that's what we were doing. Okay, thanks. So yes, the proposal is to to accept to to uh, adopt both of those resolutions. I make a motion we adopt both resolutions. I second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 <laughs> Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right. That motion passes. Uh, who, by the way, is taking notes today? That is me. Okay, Dave, uh, gather that you've captured that. Uh, yep, I am. That we take um, particularly important to capture. Yep, I am. Great. All right, so going back to the list, the next issue is issue seven. How or when does the project get officially named? Um, so because the problem with the links because it links to issue five, which has been resolved. Oh shit! I'm not sure where seven is. Hold on, let me find it. <laughs> yeah, there's a problem there. You're right. Here we go. If you click on uh, Bobby's table, it works. Yeah, well, on the left, they are on the list also. Thanks. So it, 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 this is mostly about, you know, at what point do we try to name the project? There was this discussion. Does it come before the proposal is done? Do we do it after? And this is just trying to have <coughs> been done, in fact, I believe, <clears throat> which is that basically a proposal comes with a name that hopefully is at least acceptable for the time being. And uh, you know, and then um, eventually the marketing committee is responsible for giving the the final name. I mean, the yeah, the the big the biggest disadvantage is <laughs> if you do change names, then you know, Rai has more work to do because he has to change the repository name and that kind of stuff it can be a bit. Of, but no, know. actually, that it all the linking and everything just. It, it automatically folds uh, yeah. and stuff. It's a yep, fairly, yeah. Does that include mailing lists and rocket chat oh, stuff? Well, there's a bunch of other stuff. Um, you know, I would, I would counsel like not changing names, not for this project, but on another project we had, we started out with a, a great code name that everyone loved, which I think was project uh, Rotterdam. And uh, it ended up becoming, I think Fido and all the internal resources for that are still, prefixed with uh, Rotterdam, which is a much longer thing to type than FDIO, right? So choose short names and please don't change them. <laughs> hey. you know, but, I mean, you know, we don't, it, it seems to me that creating mailing lists and so forth before, um, I mean, couldn't there just be a general mailing list for use for proto projects that haven't had their name approved yet? Because just not to rehash the whole discussion, but you know, the, the, the alternative is that the marketing committee has to get involved up front and decide on the name before the TSC approves it, which is also seen as a bit of a waste in case of, you know, the TSC might decide, well, we're not going to create this project. Maybe we create a lab or, or we don't accept it at all. And then all of this work has been done for nuts. Well, the names could still be used for the lab, right? And that way, when it, if it moved from lab to incubation, it would already be named. That's true. I, I, 
think there's there's two things the proposal didn't also capture. One is, um, I mean, it's kind of I, ideal that the developers themselves feel like, you know, they've got a resonance with the name. I mean, <laughs> it'd be funny to be told, congratulations, your project's been approved and you will now be called Robert. Um, I, yeah, uh, so that's so, what your parents uh, did to you, though. <laughs> <laughs> Ouch! Uh, you got me there. I yes. I, boy, we we're having fun this morning. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Is this even a problem? How many projects have come in that had to change names? Yeah. No, uh, you know. Hey, hey, let's but, not beat the you know a, a dead horse here. I agree uh, with Vipin. You know, I mean. Ba- Basically, uh, we we uh, you know they have to work together. Obviously, the modeling <coughs> committee cannot hand down a name that the project developers do not accept. It has to be a collaborative effort. I mean, the whole idea of this hyperledger is a collaborative effort. So, if we cannot right. even collaborate on a name, then you know why be here? <laughs> well, and Thank I don't you, mind Robert. this. I I think the spirit of this resolution is 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 fine we're just saying the project's going to do its best to pick a name but until it goes to the marketing committee it's not final and we're prepared to help the project change the name if they have to change the name that's that's the spirit that's the spirit which i mean this is basically a reflection of what we already do yes i think that's that's just codifying what we already do so i motion for a vote to accept this uh issue seven i second that all in favor? Aye. Aye. Yes. Aye. 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 <laughs> Just once, though, Mark. Uh, oh, all opposed? <laughs> uh, anybody abstaining? All right. Uh, sorry, what was that? Recorded. Silas, who you were uh, abstaining? Uh, only because I'm late. <laughs> Okay. Missed uh, most of that discussion. Okay. Uh, this is over issue seven, uh, when we name a project. Uh, so really, there's, there's no change from the draft that's been up there from uh, July 16th, maybe, but uh, just as well. All right. So we have one more we might be able to tackle today, which is issue eight. How do we deal with a new project coming in that is already a shipping product for a company? And um, in particular, this this touches on the on the status of the project. And uh, I mean, so far, all the projects we've received, they they first started in incubation and then eventually moved to active status. Although they didn't all do that, but that would be the next step, right? And the question was that came up in discussions before was really, hey, if the project was really mature, imagine there's a project that comes in, they already have a community, they already have their act together, it's a open source. Can they just be in active status from the get-go? And so essentially the crux of this resolution is to say no. It, uh, the, all the projects will start in incubation. And I actually had an term. <laughs> At some point, I had proposed that at the at the time of the proposal to the TSC, the project leaders might say, "Hey, uh, we believe we can also qualify to move to active status immediately because we meet the exit criteria of incubation." But when we looked into the detail, we realized, well, actually, that's not practically possible because there are things like, you know. You're supposed to have created a community. You have to have a, a, even a, a repo within Hyperledger, mailing list, all that stuff. I mean, it would take at least a few days. So practically speaking, it's impossible to, to have both of those things happen at the same time. So this ends up saying, no, it might be fairly short. You might be able to get to, a, to propose to transition to active status pretty quickly, but it won't be you know, on day one. And in all cases, that means project starts incubation. All right, anybody require clarifying? Uh, Any clarifying questions?
No, I think Arno articulated it very well, and I'd make a motion to accept this. I second it. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Anybody abstaining? All right, motion carries. Resolution right. eight is adopted. So, so we really have just for future reference. We, we still have two major issues left, and I'm sorry to say they are not the easiest. Maybe that's what's left. Obviously, uh, there is the criteria for the first major release, which we have never really nailed down, and then there is you know this question of sub projects. So, I will try to get the group to. Uh, to make progress on those issues. There is also a, there is a third one, but the third one is pretty much a given if we solve the other ones. Well, I think we can spare a couple minutes if you want to tee up one of those uh, issues. Uh, sometimes that stimulates people to go actually respond on the, on the wiki if they wouldn't otherwise do it. Okay, so I, I can I can say the, the the one that's kind of moot is the issue three, which you know. So we have issue two, which is the criteria to for first major release, and then we had issue three, which is and what after the first major release. And basically, if you click on issue three, you'll see there's a proposed resolution that says, well, the same will apply for every major release. So of course, it's kind of punting because. <laughs> We haven't, until we actually define those criteria for the first major release, just saying, hey, for every major release, we use the same criteria as the first major release is kind of, you know, uh, it's meta a little bit. But so that's where we are. And you may remember that when it came to the first major release, we had these discussions and Dave had started, um, you know, uh, developing a draft of what he called the, propo the the project readiness. And I think what's going to be the most challenging part is to kind of, you know, articulate, we, we've made the efforts in the past, right, to differentiate the readiness of the project as an organization, the community, which is reflected in the incubation versus active status and the readiness of the product, the software that is being produced by that project, and which is reflected in whether they have a major release or not, right? And, uh, and we've all agreed that there is not an absolutely clean separation. And so we need to really nail that down to a clear description of, you know, what what it, and and my problem with you know no offense to Dave's effort because I you know he, he definitely tried to put some stuff on paper which is always nice, but it, it kind of merges back those two things with that you know and we need to try to separate those things again as much as we can, uh, accepting that it's not possible one hundred percent. But that's where, in my opinion, the issue really is. It it lies there. Yeah, and to, I just want to support Arno's uh, assessment that, yeah, you have brought a lot of clarity to this um, in your efforts, and I appreciate it. Um, there are a lot of technical things around project readiness, uh, which is why, you know, that dealing with security and stuff, which is why I had originally started this effort. Um, we have a lot of, like, a lot of details that need to be, you know, a lot of check marks that need to be ticked for a project to be quote unquote ready. Um, and I don't want to go into them here, but it's it's quite extensive, like the CII badging, um, you know, CI pipelines, security audits, a lot of other things. And so, then I would say, just for to touch kind of an intro to issue six, the sub project. I think it, you know, I honestly don't know how we're going to really make progress on that one because there are fundamentally like different philosophies and people have different opinions. There are pros and cons to different approaches. And I don't know, I haven't seen any sign that there is some kind of convergence or there's a majority of people saying, yeah, we should do this or not. 
and, and it really comes down to this notion of do we multiply the number of top level projects, accepting that quite a few of those may not be totally independent from one another. So like we've talked about in the past, we had Composer, which is completely dependent on Fabric. And then we have Explorer, which really only supports Fabric. And is that okay? Or do we say no, when we have projects like this, they should be sub projects of the top level projects. So instead of having Hyperledger Explorer, you could have an Explorer sub projects of Fabric. And in many cases, we already have those. So if you look at Fabric, we have many different SDKs. They pretty much function as separate projects. Even the Fabric CA is a separate repo and we have different maintainers in different repos. Fabric samples is a different list of maintainers. And so, you know, and we had proposals even this week again, right? There's a Justicia uh, pro proposal and this question came up is like, well, what do, what place do we give it? Uh, do we make that a sub project? And so I honestly don't know, you know, that we have uh, uh, some kind of convergence of mind there. I hear people arguing pretty <laughs> uh, strongly on one way or the other. Okay, um, thanks for, for teeing those up. Looking at issue number two, uh, I wonder if we could get that resolution built into a, a set of bullet points. And yeah, so that's that's yes that's part of what i meant by i'm going to try to make progress mm -hmm. i i mean history shows that basically i have to put proposal before the group to look at and say no i don't like this or oh but you forget that that kind of provokes people's thinking and we can make progress i haven't really done that here uh, if you look it just says oh insert here any criteria from this project readiness proposal blah 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 so this needs to be fleshed out okay uh, great i will do that all right thanks again for uh leading us through that arno okay into uh housekeeping territory and uh the cicd committee um there was an update put up around the, the 25th that maybe people have had a chance to read. I'm not sure, but uh, I've, I've linked it there into the agenda. Um, not looking for a discussion at this point, but uh, Dave, if you want to just give a couple words on the status of the committee. Yeah, so um, there have been a lot going on behind the scenes. Right when we were about to come to some form of a conclusion we had one more option come in which was azure pipelines um, that some people from the fabric team are looking at and it looks very promising and has kind of reset us back into hmm maybe this meets all of our requirements we're not quite ready to give up on our investigations on circle ci and some of the other solutions um, but uh, yeah, we were all kind of offline last week for the, the member summit and the current status is there's a lot going on behind the scenes. We're gonna have another update fairly soon. I don't know exactly when, but the uh, CICD meeting tomorrow will be largely about discussing what everybody has learned in the last couple of weeks, testing out Azure pipelines and, and stuff like that. So still the goal is to try to come up with sort of a one CI solution to rule them all, you know, is that even possible or not? Um, so we're going to be trying to answer that tomorrow. And yeah, if you guys want to participate, if you're concerned about the CI on your project, definitely come and join the meeting. Um, but we are definitely getting to the point where we can effectively report back, I think. It's, it's been a long slog because there have been so many technical options and, and hurdles and things like that, so. Okay. Yeah. Dave, how many, how many projects are participating in this committee? Well, so it's kind of come and go. Um, consistently, it's not all of the projects, but we've had a very good participation from the Fabric team. Again, I want to thank them. You know, Brett specifically has been on top of this since day one and consistently attending. We've had uh, people from Burrow show up. We've had people from Sawtooth show up. 
uh, Aroha, uh, Indy, Ursa, Aries. Um, I've reached out to like the explorer and composer groups and stuff, but we haven't seen anybody from them. So it's, it's, it's a good um, half of our projects, you know, a lot of the, the, the core platforms and stuff. So I feel like the engagement's pretty high. Once we have better answers, um, I plan on going to maintainers of all the projects and getting their direct feedback on our proposal, kind of like how Arno is going about the uh, life cycle stuff um, before we make our final report. Okay. Okay, because in theory, everyone's supposed to be using the same basic flow and all, right? Isn't well, that part of the charter and the rules? The original goal of this workforce was to, or work group was to answer, can we have one CI CD pipeline for all projects? And that answer hasn't been sufficiently determined yet because then all the other questions fall from there. If the answer is yes, then which one? If the answer is no, then which ones are we going to support? And do we make, you know, how do we decide which ones to support? Blah, 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 that kind of stuff. The, the, so we are, um, yeah, so th thanks for the update, Dave. Uh, I just need to manage the clock here because we've got a lot of agenda left. Roger. Uh, one, one closing thought on this is as that committee meets, uh, I'll ask that, that you guys think about uh, when we started it, it looked like it was going to be a real short-term thing and a committee made sense. If it looks like this will be an ongoing thing, please think about whether this should be properly rechartered as something like a working group that is community-led and uh, how that might impact participation and, and resolution. Noted, Dan. I think okay. tomorrow's um, meeting will answer on, a lot of those questions. Moving on, speaking of working groups, to the, the working group. Okay. Thanks, Dave. Um, so the, the working groups committee, um, I'm guessing that, that we haven't. Uh, there's, yeah, there's nothing to report at this point, although I think we've made enough progress on the life cycle stuff. We can start having that conversation. So um, I'm not ready to put a date on it, but I will start sending some stuff out and start coordinating it. We've got some of the notes from before. We just need to go back and organize them. Okay, great. And then um, I think that the approach that Arno has adopted with with having a, a series of resolutions seems it's, to have been really effective. Great, and, yeah, it's also a yeah. great use of the wiki. So I think we're figuring out how to use our tools and that worked. Cool. Yeah, I agree. I'm really happy with how that's going. All right. Uh, okay, subsequent to when I put the agenda together, somebody added uh, some new project proposal discussions. Um, I'm not quite prepared to go through those because I haven't visited those yet, but let's make sure that, that we hit those next week. Um, we have reports available for Burrow and Indy today. When I checked in on these late yesterday, it seemed Burrow had been, the Burrow report had been most read. So let's go ahead and start with that. And we can um, prioritize clarifying questions that, that people have for Burrow. So if people want to on their own follow the link to the, the Q3 Burrow report. Um, yeah, I could, I could kick things off. The, the, I'm happy to answer any questions about the specific items, but basically the, the project is going along um, much as it has done uh, with an in, increased amount of stuff getting done. Actually, we've had quite a bumper set of features. Um, and to my non-scientific observations, it seems like there's a bit of an uptick in both in chat and issues getting made. Um, we're still not uh, breaking out of the Monax dominated maintainer and contributorship um, but yeah, the, the main thing that I was interested perhaps in raising with the TSC was, uh, yeah, it's kind of dawned on me and, and seeing some of these issues come up that um, I, I think probably Burrow's, the, the, the one end of Burrow's user and contributor funnel is being really hurt by our um, lacking documentation in particular on the one hand. And then on the other hand, um, a kind of lack of vision or philosophy for Burrow and get people to understand why they might choose it and uh, to, to realize actually that there's kind of most of the value that's been added to it in the last year, two years, has nothing to do with EVM. Um, 
which is not a perception that is there. So um, as I say in the, in the update, I've got a, a blog post I'm preparing. I, uh, I'm not sure who I need to talk to about that to, to see if we can get that on Hyperledger blog, but as a bit of a, a refresher on Burrow, then a, a, a sort of deeper look into some of the features and then a, a plea for help. But I also think that there's some low level stuff, some of which we, we, we can find time to do, but around the getting started documentation and so on that would stop us from losing people. So we're getting issues from people who are saying like, oh, look, this doesn't work. Like these two flags are incompatible. Um, you know, one person reports that how many people just walked away from the project? My suspicion is quite a few. Um, so yeah, I don't know if there's any advice or any, particularly any channels, once this blog post is ready and uh, we, we tidy up the docs, my push for contributors would be to try and get people to come on and create some, not super heavyweight, but create some documentation of their own experiences with Burrow. Because a lot of people are, seem to be doing this. But if I could push people over the line to actually get that contributed to the project, I think that would be a big win. Um, and for the broader, like, what is Burrow? Why would you use it? Uh, any, uh, any advice as how I could get that out, I'll, I'll try and get it on the Hyperledger blog. Um, but if anyone else has any channels that that could go out on and, and that would make sense for them, uh, then I'm all ears. Do, do you almost have to take a step back and fix some of the documentation and code sample issues before you do a blog post? Because if you do a blog post, people are going to try it and have all the issues you run into and they're going to walk away. And I mean, you know, they may not come back to borrow, but they also may not come back to Hyperledger. They may infer quality <laughs> of other projects based on borrow. Yeah, no, that's, that's a good point. Um, the, I mean, the tension, <laughs> the tension for us is that, you know, we're, we're a startup trying to um, earn our lunch um, and, and this isn't directly um, like benefiting us right now. Having said that, yes, I, I, ha I am. So, I mean, in the, on these particular issues, so I put in there, I think one fairly simple thing we can do is just make sure that we're running our, our code snippets with our CI. Um, so that's something I would like to, to get going. Another former contributor maintainer, um, I can't remember, what he ended up as has, has come back into the fray. So I'm going to see if I can get some help from him. I've also added some docs. I mean, actually some of the docs that were broken were actually new docs um, that, that people wanted to hear about. But yeah, no, you're right. I think that <clears throat> I think that we can certainly find some time to have a little bit of a push on you know, the documentation that we do have to, to, to make that so it actually works and you get a nice experience off that. Um, we also have a, a workshop that we put together that that is actually quite a good little tutorial. Um, I don't know if we could reformat that, but um, yeah, I feel like the, I mean, I don't want to let the, uh, the perfect be the enemy of the good, but it, it can be a huge time sink once you get into these things. I, I do try and find some time for it, but could really do with some, some assistance from perhaps from people who are, and there's been a few false starts with people who kind of wanted to get involved in a project. Burrow doesn't have quite the contention ratio as say Fabric. Um, but they never quite got off the ground. So I don't know if Salona's on the call, um, but uh, if there's anyone from the community who knows of a, an intern or someone interested um, who doesn't necessarily need to, to, to have expert coding skills just yet, who would like to get their foot in the door of a project, then, then uh, I, I'm ready to be reintroduced. And yeah, I'm, I'm gonna make a bit more time for this myself over the next month. And you're right, I should, I should do that before the blog post goes out. Maybe if you send something internally to Hyperledger first, um, like even to the TSC list, people could go through, you know, I could dedicate a day to going through and running through and seeing what works, what doesn't work, based off, you know, as, as someone who doesn't know it. That would be and, brilliant, yeah. And if other people could do that too. Yeah, and, yeah so I, I... On the call too, and uh, there was a really good response to this in um, Brazil. So I think there is stuff that's done in Portuguese. So we should probably try to figure out how to intersect with the people who um, did such a good demo of Burrow at the boot camp in Brazil. And uh, Jessica, could you provide guidance to uh, Silas on the blog path or, or suggest someone who would be appropriate for that? Oh. <laughs> Hello. Uh, yeah, of course. Um, so if you're willing to put a blog together, um, I can send you over uh, some guidelines um, if that would be helpful. Um, 
just, you know, email me jrampin at, G, at uh, linuxfoundation.org. Um, and I can, I can get that over to you and work together with the PR team to kind of fine tune it and, you know, add in images and anything else that make it a little bit more inter interesting. Okay. So we'll, I think it'll take me maybe till the end of next week to, to f finish out uh, a rough draft that I have in Markdown. Okay. At that point, I'll send that round to the TSC and I'll send it, send it over to you as well. Yeah. Um, get, get some feedback there and make sure um, any, any suggested tutorials or work freeze actually work. Yeah. That sounds great. Okay. Well, thanks Silas and uh, the Brewer team for the update. And we need to quickly speed along now to the uh, Indie update. So one thing that I happened to notice in, in this update was the, the dialogue at the bottom with uh, Chris and Steven. Uh, it appeared that, um, I think this is the one that, that uh, seemed like Steven was not aware of the, the CI task force. So one yeah, of that, that doesn't surprise me that Steven wasn't aware of the CI task force. Also, I think in this report, the, some of the frustrations from the team kind of bubbled into the report. Um, the thought was with the CI task force going on, that giving as much of an unvarnished opinion about you know what it had what what frustrations that were around CI/CD um, would be helpful. Um, and you know I think perhaps that uh, feedback wasn't taken in the same spirit it was given. <laughs> <laughs> well, I I think it is very helpful to have uh, unvarnished opinions, as you put it. Uh, it's good to have. I mean, the, the whole point of these updates is to make sure that the, the TSC and the projects are in communication. Um, so offline, if, if Stephen or somebody else wants to provide feedback about why they weren't aware of something that was pretty well publicized up to that point, we'll figure out why there's a disconnect in, in publicizing the committee. <laughs> And, so uh, I think the committee's pretty well well aware of where the indie build system is at and what's been going on there. I know Mike has been active on that committee, and I think that that feedback has been incorporated. Um, Stephen has been working through Mike on that, so Stephen's not as aware of what's going on there. But I don't think he's dis. I don't think that the process is disconnected. Okay, so if the process isn't disconnected, then I guess um, the other thing is just the the feedback that's directly in here about those frustrations with CI/CD. Uh, those on the committee can can hopefully read through this report and round out their uh, understanding. Yeah, yeah. I, I welcome I, this feedback. I welcome you know, like direct feedback like this. So uh, <laughs> personally, I'm totally cool with this. I I was about to say the exact same thing, Ryan. Thank you. Um, I also did want to point out that the indie team was uh, heavily engaged. When Mike was, he and I ran some experiments early on um, to test. Uh, community volunteers adding resources to uh, a build pool. And that actually informed a lot of our early efforts. So, yeah, I just want to acknowledge the Indie team has been connected in. Okay. Um, Nathan, is there anything that, that you wanted to ask of the TSC issues that you wanted to highlight beyond the CI stuff? Um, you know, just one thing to pay attention to between these projects is um, we're working on the, the split of code from the Indie code base into the Aries code base. Um, and so we're still working on how that um, divide uh, happens logistically. Um, things are going well there, but it's an area to pay attention to. Um, I know especially some of the folks at the Decentralized Identity Foundation and elsewhere ha um, have been a little bit nervous about what standardization for a wallet layer would mean and whether um, they need to, to participate more heavily in Hyperledger areas specifically. Um, so I'm hoping we see a, a healthy evolution there. I think the Indy and the Aries communities are starting to solidify and understand kind of how those two pieces fit together and where the um, divide between them are. Um, as we get some of the folks from the diff participating more in Aries, we might see a little bit more um, controversy around some of the decisions that are being made now. And do you still use the term plenum or is that Indy node? Um, so Indy, uh, Indy plenum is the, the base ledger framework and then Indy node 
adds essentially the identity transaction family and identity spe specialization on top of plenum. So the Indy project still has those two core components. Okay, and I, and I don't see updates on plenum in here. Is that sort of ledger 2.0 then? Yeah, the ledger next, Indy ledger next channel in Rocket Chat is where that discussion has been going on. Um, Evernim has kind of resourced down some of its efforts on the Ledger Next project. Um, we've been recruiting contributors around um, to help with that. Um, we have some lined up that want to start here in the fall. Um, so I expect in the Q4 report we'll have more um, around what's going on with the updates to the plenum layer. Okay. Well, great. I don't hear anybody else speaking up with uh, questions. So thanks, Nathan, and the rest of the Indy team for putting together a very detailed report. And that brings us to the end of our time here. So just as a, a heads up for next week, uh, we've got the two uh, proposals that are being raised. I um, it looks like there's a good so, bit of discussion in the wiki there that, that people could catch up on beforehand. Dan, do we need to vote on these updates or do we not do that anymore? Uh, I don't recall us voting on them in, in a long time. What we decided was the checklists at the bottom are for acknowledging that people have, have read them. And there's right. not really a decision okay. to be made about the report. Okay. Just All right. Well, that brings us to the end of the hour. Thanks again for everybody's time and uh, um, look forward to uh, speaking again next week.